is a Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So welcome to Connections, church together at home and online. In my previous work, I was part of the national staff team for a membership organisation whose work was entirely reliant on the volunteer leaders that worked amongst young people in local groups all over the country. Some of you will know the work of Girls' Brigade. I recall an occasion not long after I took a role on this team when I dropped into a local GB leaders meeting in my home area. It was where I'd grown up with the leaders there um, and had been a member in Girls' Brigade locally as a girl and then as a young leader as well. Imagine then my reaction when I walked into the room that evening and I heard a dear friend of mine um, say, mark my presence if you like, by saying, shh, Ruth's here, she's one of them now. By them, my friend was referring to my having become part of the headquarters team as we tended to be referred to as. Suddenly, I'd become different. I was part of another group. I was not in, I was other. Uh, there was, of course, humour in my friend's introduction and in many ways she was simply, I think, trying to affirm my new role. Yet the comment really stuck with me. It made me feel different, no longer part of that group and a guardedness now existed between us. Because, of course, them at, up at headquarters made lots of dif um, decisions that affect us in the local teams. Even though we all served the same cause, we were all leaders in Girls' Brigade seeking to engage young people in faith discovery to help girls become followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, Girls' Brigade's aim. Now, I don't say this to criticise Girls' Brigade at all. I love GB and all we do. I'm still a member. I offer this just as an example of the power of language, the impact that terms such as them and they have on us. I guess some people would say that this kind of use of these words is inevitable. It's usual, it's just how we speak and it doesn't mean anything. We have to distinguish between groups and roles at times and how else do we do this other than by using words that explain who we are in relation to someone else. Me, you, them, us. And of course, there's a truism, isn't there, that in all organisations, people are placed through various systems into groups or roles that include holding responsibility for decision-making at times. The rub of this, of course, comes when we're affected by those decisions, especially if we don't agree with them or we feel excluded from the decision-making process. You know, just look at Methodism, for example. We are set up as a connectional movement. At our heart, we're structured to include all of us in decision-making. Yet, in reality, we still suffer um, from a way of speaking that, if we're not careful, accentuates that sense of other. Locally, we refer to other chapels as them, as opposed to us. We report news from the circuit team by saying they said, as if the team is made up of members that aren't part of our church um, family. We refer to district or connection in terms that suggest separateness. We say things like, when will they tell us the rules for the COVID procedures? Just one example. Can you, like me, hear yourself using terms uh, like they and them in your everyday conversation. Words that are difficult to avoid and in themselves quite neutral, but how quickly these terms can move us from uh, feeling together 
to being in a place where we're being othered or we are othering someone through our speech. What's that expression? Careless talk costs lives. We see it happen towards so many groupings in society. Lawmakers, the wealthy, the poor, migrants, people of different faiths, homeless people, those who follow a different team from us or are of a different race or colour or gender or sexuality from us. They become them, don't they? They said, they did, they think. Uh, we see cartoons and jokes and hear slang terms that normalise this othering and negatively or sometimes disparagingly emphasise stereotypical images or traits of a particular group that is not our group, it's them and the way they do it. One high profile example of this that I guess many of us will be noticing just now is the repeated use of the term they in relation to American politics. They being the Democratic Party. They stole the election. They defrauded the voting. Suddenly the use of language shifts from neutral terminology that describes a person or a group in relation to another group to wording that begins to separate people in divisive ways and implies blame. They are doing this. They are doing something that is in some way incorrect. At its worst, the use of terms like this have the power to incite hatred. Togetherness is threatened and words become a weapon that others people, um, it works in a way that begins to suggest, suggest it's legitimate to exclude a group or a person, to ignore them, even to do harm to them by being biased against them, um, to treat people in unjust ways. You see it, don't you, in the media. As we come to Advent, which is a time of year when we prepare to celebrate the coming of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, it seems meaningful and urgent to draw on the deep togetherness that we are called to in our life of faith and in our prayers for the world. You remember a, a famous verse in John chapter 3 verse 16 where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. To me, the picture is clear in John's words. We're all included in God's salvation plan. There's no grouping that's excluded here. There is no divisiveness at the heart of God. His son was named Emmanuel, God with us. Not God with us as opposed to them, but God with all of us, his world. There will always be systems and groupings and opinions and teams. Realistically, a structured world will always include bosses and leaders, authorities and powers. And the creative power of God means that the world is jam-packed full of diversity and difference. God created and saw that it was good. Yet through our frailty, through our prejudice, through our lust for power, or simply by carelessness, othering does occur. And it's within this reality that our calling to be part of a story that shuns this sort of othering of one another and celebrates and models the coming of Jesus as good news for all. We may, may not be able to change the language of big politics all by ourselves, but as we journey towards Advent um, this year, we can take a fresh look at our everyday language, asking the Lord to make us aware of how we participate in the gospel through our own speech and ask him to help us be more mindful of any creeping shift in our attitudes towards others, because sometimes language leads to attitude. 
Orders attitude lead to language? There's a question for us. Which comes first? I think there are some practical ways in which we can uh, think about this during Advent, maybe even this week. Three things that we could do. It's got subsections too, but bear with me. The first, I think, is really to take a, a fresh look at the Gospels and see how many times Jesus actually made a beeline for people who are, were considered others in his community. You know, the ones that even his disciples sometimes shunned. Zacchaeus, because he was a tax collector. The woman at the well, because she had a dodgy history. The parable of the Good Samaritan. All examples of how Jesus actually included people that others would other. Talk about them as a them. And by looking again at those stories of how Jesus went towards people who others would other, um, perhaps a fresh insight will uh, rise within us. The second thing is, I think we can be honest with ourselves. That this week, as we go through our everyday life, let's look at our speech and our inner attitudes. Let's take note of the times we use the term them and they this week. And then as we do so, ask the Lord to show us whether there are ways in which we are actually falling into this trap of othering people in our language, suggesting maybe that they're less than us or that they are to blame for something. It was them. It was him. It was they. And asking the Holy Spirit to refresh our language and our hearts. I think as we do that, one of the things that the Holy Spirit can do in us is give us that sense of a new heart within us that's soft towards others in our community that says we're part of the same. We may be different in some ways, but we are part of God's whole. God so loved the world. The third thing that practically I think we can do during this time is to pray for people and situations in our community and in the wider world that are really affected by them and they language. That God will bring communities together in new ways that value and respect the, each other and in ways that heals unrest. So a challenge for us, let's get rid of the language of them and they and let's celebrate the language of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, all of us. Amen. This song was written for Advent, but I think we can sneak it in a week before because it seems pertinent. It's an opportunity for us just to reflect on how do we give Jesus room to continually refresh our hearts and our speech and our attitudes towards one another. So let's listen and take the opportunity to invite Jesus in. Oh, behold, the mystery now unfolds. See the star shine on the virgin foretold. Angels sing.
Jesus, help us to prepare room for you and to let you, the King of glory, enter in to our lives, to our speech and to our community and in this world. Bring healing and bring justice, we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> 